Well, good morning once again to everyone. Good morning. Today I'm continuing our series of sermons. Um, we had a little bit of a break last week to enjoy some good uh, bluegrass uh, gospel music, which I hope you all enjoyed uh, that concert. I sure did. And uh, today we're going to continue that series. Uh, there, I've got two sermons left in this series. And this week we're looking at the message, Good God. And I don't mean like, Good God, what happened? <laughs> We're talking about how good God is and the goodness of God. I don't know if you pay much attention to this, but in the book of Genesis, in Genesis 1 alone, six times when God was creating, He makes the statement and God saw that it was good. But really that definition uh, or that statement can mention God. God is the one who is good. And God makes all things that are good. Maybe you remember the story of Jesus in the New Testament encountering the rich young ruler or the rich young man who came to him and asked what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. Remember what Jesus told him? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the man went away sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus knew his intentions in his heart were focused on his wealth and not on God. And at the beginning of that story, the rich young man said to Jesus in uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, it says, Jesus started on his way and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Which I find interesting because, you know, Jesus is God and Jesus was the Son of God, but yet... He didn't consider himself good, only God alone as being good. And I thought that is a neat statement. And we could uh, uh, probably uh, speculate, debate why Jesus said this, but I believe the point of the message is for us to understand that Jesus recognized the goodness of his Father, and we should as well. You know, there's not nothing, there's nothing bad about God. You know, he is holy, he is righteous, uh, he is without sin. But to get into that in more detail, what does the goodness of God really mean? Why is God good? Or how is He good? And so that's what I'm going to look at this morning with, with three simple points, or three simple things we can look at about the goodness of God. The first thing is God's character is good. God's character is good. The dictionary describes character as the mental or moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Uh, we usually think of a person's character as being someone who has high moral values or who's honest, full of integrity, you know, dependable, they're a servant, they're an example to others, all of those things. Well, God is all of those things and more. No one can be as good as God. Uh, we even know, Scripture teaches us that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. No matter how good a person is, no matter how good they seem to be, none of us can make it through a day without sinning and falling short. None of us can, can come up to the character of God. Even though I hope most of us, uh, or all of us, will try to have high character as a Christian. We want to have the highest character. We want to have high morals and high values. We want to be an example to other people. We want to inspire others. That sort of thing. There's nothing wrong with, with striving to be like God and wanting to have His qualities. But God's qualities uh, are things like this and even more. You know, He's the very definition of what holy and righteous character should look like. And Paul wrote this letter to Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy, and he warned of those false prophets who were following evil spirits and not God's plan. And in the text, Paul mentions the goodness of God. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-5, through 5, Paul said this about those false prophets. He said, They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. So, again, God is the very definition of good and His character is good and everything He created is good. Now, I understand that Satan and mankind messed that up, that we you know, brought sin into the world. But even when sin came into this sinful, broken world, God provided His goodness was evident by Him sending Jesus His Son. 
And then God provided a way for us to be saved and to overcome sin and to overcome His wrath and all that. And that alone shows the character of God that He was willing to sacrifice His own Son. And that everything He intended was to be for good. And an interesting thing he says there too was that it was uh, everything was consecrated by word of God and prayer. Consecrated basically means to, to set apart something. And in other words, we set apart things by the word of God and by praying to God. And I think the point of that is God is good and his character is good and he can't help but make good things. You know, when, when you're God and you're good, you can't help but overflow with goodness. There's nothing bad found in him. And I believe the same we say and hear that's popular today is very true. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. You know, God doesn't even have it in his character to even be bad or to sin. Uh, and, and, and so that's something that we can look at to know how God's goodness is. is his character, his qualities are, are at all times holy and righteous. And I think that's something that me and you need to strive for. You know, even though we cannot be perfect and we can't be like God in that sense, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't make an effort to strive to be like Him. I, I want to have godly character, and I hope that you want to have godly character too. John, in one of his letters, just shows us how good God's character truly is in 1 John chapter 4. Verses 7 through 9, he said, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son, uh, he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. If that's not the definition of the goodness of God, then I don't know what it is, because God is the very definition of love. And John makes it real simple that we need to love one another because love comes from God and we need to love others like God does. And if you've been born of God and know God, then you are. You have that type of love. And if you don't know God, then you don't have that kind of love because God, in essence, His very character is love. Unconditional love. And so it's important for us to, to develop these God-like characters. But that's how we can know God is good is through His character. <coughs> The second thing that we can know about God, goodness is His will is good. Not only is His character impeccable and perfect and sinless and holy and righteous, but so is His will. God's will is good. God doesn't have an ill will for any of us. God's plans and God's will for all of us is nothing but goodness. God's will is good. His qualities are good. His desire for me and you and the church is goodness. I know sometimes people will make statements like, oh, you know, God doesn't like me, or God's trying to punish me, or, you know, God can never love me, or God can never forgive me, and all that stuff is, is lies from, from hell. You know, God doesn't hate anyone. Um, I'm sure God is disappointed with our mistakes and our shortcomings, and I'm sure we break God's heart sometimes, but God's desire is love, to love us, to forgive us. He wouldn't have sent Jesus to die for our sins once and for all if he didn't believe that we could overcome sin and live in right relationship with him. But one of the things he gives us is his will, and his will for my, me and you are good. Look at what Paul reminded the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Is what is good pleasing and perfect will. God's will is good, but not only is it good, it's pleasing and it's perfect. God doesn't make mistakes. You know, we make mistakes, but God doesn't make mistakes. And His will for us is good. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning a little bit about how, uh, you know, sometimes bad things happen to us and we want to blame God. But, but the reality is, the truth is, if we, if life is good all the time, if life never had problems and it was just peachy all the time, pretty soon we would not need God. We would think, I don't need God. Things are going good. Why do I need God? But also on the other side of that, I believe when God sends trials or allows trials and tribulations to come in our life, He tests us and helps us grow in our faith. Not only do we learn to appreciate God and the strength He provides and the comfort He provides, but we learn to grow 
in our faith and see the bigger picture that God actually has a good will for us even though we have to go through some hills and valleys along the way. And it's important for us to understand that we, the key to his good will is the first part of that, not conforming to the pattern of this world. Because we all know, or hopefully we know, that the pattern of this world is not the same pattern of God. The world's will for us is not the same as God's, and even the will, our own will for ourselves is not the same as God's many times. The things we want to do uh, is not always what God wants us to do. But one of the key things he says there, if you are renewing your mind every day, and you're being transformed, being transformed means you're allowing God to come into your life and change you from the inside out. You know, that you will think different and have a different perspective and look at things different, look at things through his eyes. You'll begin loving like he does and begin seeing things as he does. But if we're doing those things and we're renewing our mind and our thoughts and our perspective, we'll be able to know what God's will is. I've heard that statement I don't know how many times. And unfortunately, I have even worded it myself where someone has told me, how do you know what God's will is for my life? I don't know what God's will is. And I've even pondered that question myself. You know, what is God's will for my life? But I think we can know God's will if we seek Him out honestly without uh, hidden motives or without uh, allowing the world to influence us. We can know what God wants us to do because I believe God has nothing but goodness for us. That doesn't mean perfect. That doesn't mean never without problems. That doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. It simply means that the, the bigger picture is God has good plans for us every single day. Peter said something about God's will in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. He says, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. What he's saying there, I believe, is if me and you are, God's will is that all of us in the church, all of us Christians will do good, and our goodness will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. You know as well as I do, when you're doing good, there are always someone out there trying to knock you down. You know, when you're trying to do good for God, there are people out there who are jealous, they're insecure, um, they get angry, they, they have all these different things because they're not seeking God's will, and, and they're bringing their garbage or their problems uh, and, and putting them on you. And a lot of times when you're trying to do the right thing and do things for God, people will try to uh, uh, talk bad about you, falsely accuse you of things, uh, all kinds of things to distract from those things. But the key for me and you is to remain faithful to God, regardless of what people say. But I believe the more good we do, according to Scripture, if we continue to do good, we're going to silence those awful uh, voices that are out there trying to bring us down. So God is good. Not only is His character good and holy and righteous, but His will for us is also holy and righteous. God doesn't have a, a, an ill will or a bad will. God's not punishing certain people and, and being good to people. And sometimes that's how our minds work. Unfortunately, even as Christians, even of us that are part of the church, we sometimes think that God's put great blessings on this person because Maybe they've got talent, or maybe they look good, or they look nice, or they're popular, or, or they whatever it is in our mind we create. And, and the bottom line is, all of that is just Satan trying to distract us from the truth that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Which brings me to my final thought this morning. Not only is God's character good, not only is His will good, but God's plans are good as well. You know, God did not create us to see us fail. I don't know if we ever looked at it that way. And, and I know there's lots of deep questions out there. There's lots of things we probably wonder. I, there's things I want to know. Uh, there's things I don't understand. But I've always thought, you know, why did God create us? Why did God create me? Kind of, we were just going to screw it up. <laughs> you know, and then he'd have to go through this thing with, with his, his uh, son Jesus. But, but the bottom line is, God created us for his pleasure. God desired to create us in his image. We're the only thing made in his image. And he created us with a soul. We're the only ones that have a soul or his spirit. And God created us for relationship with him. You know, he created us to have that. And I believe that's why we are relational beings in a sense, because God created that desire in us. But God did not create us just for us to fail. That would be, wouldn't that be cruel? Wouldn't that be wicked to create somebody just to see them fail? God didn't create us for us to fail or fall short or remain lost. 
God created us in His image, so that, that alone tells us that He loves us and that He was willing to make us in His image. And God had a plan to save us, even though He knew we were going to screw it up. He had a plan available to us through Jesus Christ. Because He knew we couldn't save ourselves, we couldn't uh, overcome sin. Uh, even in the Old Testament, the law couldn't could protect you from sin. And even after, in the New Testament, even in today's world that we live in today, 2022, we can't save ourselves from anything. We need the help of God. And not only does God give us His Son Jesus to help save us, but then He gives us His Word, He gives us uh, prayer, He gives us the Holy Spirit, He gives us all these tools to help us grow and mature. And so His plans for us are good. And I believe God has big plans for us all. And His plans are good and are way better than any plans we could come up with. The plans I had for my life are not where I'm at. I had no plans to be a preacher. I had no plans to, to go into ministry. Um, to be honest with you, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a cop. Uh, and I wanted to be a policeman. Really, I probably wanted to be the one ranger, if I'm being honest. I wanted to be, uh, be that type of cop. But as I got older, I realized, hey, they shoot at you. I probably, and I wasn't a very good shot myself. So I realized somewhere in the early teens that probably police work was not going to be in, in my life. And so, you know, I, I, I looked under some other paths and, and still, heck, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. But if I'm being honest with you, I don't know. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that we have all these plans, all these things we want to do, and they might not necessarily be bad. You may even have things you want to do for God. You know, you might want to do this and give to that and go on this trip and be involved in this ministry or this mission. And we go through all these things in life and... and there's nothing wrong with good plans and making plans, but I want us to understand God's plans for us are way better than any plans we make for ourselves. Paul said it this way to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You know, God, you know, the Proverbs, and I can't remember which one it is, says, you know, you know, we choose a path and God determines the steps. You know, we make plans, but it's God who decides. And, and that's something for us to keep in mind. I've met a lot of people that, you know, and unfortunately, you know, there's people like, oh, I want to I wanna sing for the Lord. Well, you can't sing. So, uh, obviously, God didn't mean you to sing. Uh, that wasn't his plan for your life if you can't sing. Uh, the same way with, with, I've known people that wanted to go into ministry, they just didn't have the gifts for ministry, you know. Um, and I, I know a guy in particular that, you know, went to Bible college, and the Bible college professor says, you're not going to make it. Nobody's going to hire you. You're just not cut out for that. And he was upset and came to me, and unfortunately I told him the same thing because I wasn't going to lie to him um, because he just didn't have those, those gifts and those abilities um, to do that. Not everybody's cut out for full-time ministry. Not everybody's cut out to, to sing. Not everybody's cut out to teach. I, I don't know... I, Someday we can ask God that, but I'm pretty sure all these questions we have when we get to heaven, we're not even going to care about them anyway. Uh, but we have them down here on this earth wondering about things. I don't know why God chooses things to do the way He does and why He does things the way He does. I, I don't have those answers. As much as I've read and studied the Bible and, and been educated, I still just have a lot of more questions than I have answers. But I do know that God has good plans for us, and we are never going to be led astray by following God. We're never going to go down the wrong path following God and His Holy Spirit. God will work through us to fulfill His plans for us. And I don't know what that is. You know, you might have had plans to be a doctor, but God had other plans. You might have had plans to be a teacher, but God had other plans for you. Uh, and a lot of times, I've known people uh, who went into, the, went into the business world or went out into the world got jobs and later left those things and went into ministry. You know, they got caught in a different direction in their life, halfway through their life. I've had it, seen it happen the other way. I've seen people that were in ministry for a while left ministry, and I know we always think it's bad when, when people leave ministry, but it's, it's not always bad if God can use them in a better, more effective way in, in another career or another job. And so, you know, we can't always understand the wisdom of God and the insight of God, but the thing that me and you can do is trust Him. You know, we should be able to say, God, where do you send me? I want to go. 
Whatever you want me to do, I want to do. It may not make sense to my friends. It may not make sense to my family. People might tell me I'm crazy, and believe me, I've had all of the, I've heard all those things in my life uh, because of the decisions and choices I've made. Now, I've made a lot of bad, bad decisions and poor choices, but not all of them were bad and poor. I, 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 I believe there's times in my life where I really did what God wanted me to do. But I want us to think that, that we need to learn to give up control of our lives to God. One of the things about surrendering to God when you become a Christian is giving up control. Saying that, God, I'm going to trust you to guide my life. I'm going to quit trying to do everything myself and play God. I'm going to trust you. And so many times we want to control things and not trust God. But God's plans for our lives are far greater than many of us can even think or imagine. Paul told the Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 9, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. You understand that the things God has for us, those who love Him, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind can conceive those things. God is greater than anything we can think of or imagine His plans for us are the same. What a statement to make, Paul makes here. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no eye can grasp or conceive these things. In other words, we need to stop trying to figure it out because it ain't going to happen. Because God's mind is greater than ours. And it's not meant for us to find out. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in this. If God wanted us to know, He would have told us. You know, if God wanted us to know some of the things that we ask, He would have put it in the Scripture. He would put it on our heart. Some things are not meant for us to know because they are things of heaven or of God. Now sometimes we don't know things because we're not ready for them. We're not mature enough for them. We see some evidence of that in the Bible and especially in the Gospels where Jesus didn't want people to know because they weren't ready for it. Even some of his disciples you know, he had some things that they weren't able to grasp yet until much later so he wasn't ready for them to know that yet until they matured some more, experienced some more life with him. And so that does happen, but I believe there's lots of things that in life that we don't have answers to, or we don't know what the future holds. But one thing we can guarantee is that God has good plans for you, and you need to trust him. Even when it doesn't make sense to you or other people, you can trust him. And we need to remain faithful to God. That's a good God right there. A God with godly character. Good. Why do we call it godly character? Because it's what it is. God is good. His character is good. His will is good. And God is there for us all the time. One thing I want to close with um, is this thinking about God. And, and the praise team can go ahead and start making their way up here. But, you know, I believe God wants us to worship God wants our reverence. He wants our worship. He wants our obedience. And God, most of all, wants to use us to spread and share the gospel. You know, at this point, Jesus has already came. Jesus has already resurrected. Jesus is waiting to return. And so in the meantime, he established the church to share the gospel message, to reach the lost and make disciples. And so the way we do that is seeing the goodness of God and experiencing the goodness of God and allowing the goodness of God to work in our lives so that we can reach out to lost people. I know all of us in this room have loved ones, friends, neighbors, maybe children, grandchildren, uh, family members, co-workers. We all have people we know that don't know the Lord. And we have uh, an opportunity to pray for them. We have an opportunity to witness to them. We have an opportunity to share to them. But I believe one of the greatest tools that we have is not only us recognizing how good God is, but letting people see the goodness of God through our lives. And I hope you're able to do that this morning. Uh, before I close, I just realized this. If you're following me along in your outline, I got, got the point wrong. <laughs> uh, the third point is God's plans are good. And I think I left one from uh, the week before on there. Uh, uh, do good even during suffering. So I apologize for that. I just now realize I looked down at the outline. So the third point should be God's plans are good. Uh, the scriptures are correct, but I just uh, inadvertently didn't uh, delete uh, 
that third one. But at this time, I'm going to offer the invitation. And if anybody needs to respond to the invitation in any way, I'll be down front. Uh, if you're able and willing, could you please stand with us as we sing?